There we go. We're recording now. So welcome, everybody. Um, life is uh, really interesting right now, and I'm glad that we can have this talk between experts and, and go from there, or at least... Or at least, I don't know if anybody's really an expert in this, um, but let's go ahead and um, let's go ahead and, and start. Um, the so first of all, everybody that's a speaker on this group is a member of Rev. Uh, Rev, um, if anybody's on this call and can't make it, Rev is um, that's not currently a member is a networking group where we share uh, information. We have the conference together. Um, uh, there's a lot. Uh, we do a podcast um, and we're sort of like family and they're really wonderful agents, successful agents who have really good hearts. And uh, if you're not currently a member of Rev and you'd like to get on our Facebook group, just uh, there's the link for the Facebook group. Go ahead and join us. But for those that are seeing, well, the recording, they'll see the recording too. So we have about 500 members in Rev, and we'd love for you to join us. Um, we do a podcast. There's the link for the podcast. You can get it from iTunes, and you can also get it from Stitcher. Um, I have an episode airing tomorrow on the coronavirus, and it's going to be a different talk than the talk that we're having today. It's really more on personal and business strategies, perspective, and, and hope. And there's a little bit of uh, information about um, uh, some personal things that have been happening for me. And I just want to give you guys a heads up because that episode was recorded uh, last week. And um, I had found out last week that... Um, uh, uh, I found out last week that uh, uh, one of our office staff has confirmed positive for um, the virus. So several of us, Jasmine and I particularly on our team, um, were exposed. Um, and they give you 14 days to see whether or not you come up with any symptoms. And right now I'm on day 12 with no symptoms. So I don't want you, if you listen to the podcast, Mark, because it's a really good podcast, if you listen to it, don't freak out when I mention that because um, I've only got two days left and I'm pretty sure that um, I'm fine. Uh, the second thing in about another two weeks, I'm gonna be doing an episode on fear as a choice, which is about reducing anxiety and fear. And um, uh, I think that'll be a really helpful episode. I've had a lot of, I've done a lot of work on that in my life and I feel like I can really bring something to the table for each of you if that is a topic that interests you. And then finally, I have a blog called oomphblog.com, and we're going to be doing, um, I'm going to be doing the spiritual aspects of coronavirus. I know that sounds really weird, but um, if that sort of thing interests you, that should air, uh, I believe, this Sunday. We should have it up by Sunday. And then finally, um, I have decided to start um, racking up my uh, coaching practice. And one of the things that uh, we're going to do is we're going to do small groups that are reasonably priced of 12 people and under so that those individuals who really want to deal with um, uh, who really want to deal with um, these aspects of their life, lives and what they're dealing with uh, within a coaching session, we're making it very reasonably priced. And if you're if you're financially being wiped out, it's going to be almost next to nothing. Um, so those, that's the first start. Um, our presenters are all part of our group, Rev. So we have Lee Brown, Seth Daly, Don Thomas, Paul Grover, Debbie Ost, Brian Bamba, Jennifer Ames, John Smith, Lindsay Smith, and James Nellis. And they're, you know, they're all really great people and they've been a member of our group for a while and very happy uh, to have them with us. So let's just start. There's two different um, there, we're dealing with two different crises right now. First, there's a health crisis of which 33,000 have tested positive and there's been 428 deaths um, in the US. And then there's a financial crisis and the stock market has fallen by over 26%. Now, one's options and restrictions will vary state by state. Um, and the, so let's, let's take a look at that map first. So if we look at the map of the virus distribution, 
you're going to see that it tends to be in urban areas where, I mean, it makes sense. That's where most people are. Um, but New York um, and Washington State have been hit the hardest. Um, and um, so how the states react to it are going to vary according to how they have urban areas and whether they're more rural. And then there's going to be differences from state to state. So one example of a difference is in Illinois, uh, where Jenny Ames is, the uh, real estate is still considered an essential business, so they don't have to shut down. Um, in New York, real estate has been determined not to be an essential business, and we are not allowed to show properties in New York at all. So what does that mean? It means, um, for me, it means that I have no income coming in, all of my deals, everything in the pipeline is dead. Um, I, um, I have no income, so I need to find income from another source. I've been talking about doing more coaching. So that's a, something that I can do. And that's what I'm going to focus on. My boyfriend has a gym in Connecticut. His gym is non-essential and has been shut down in Connecticut. And, you know, he's doing at home training online because that's a way to get some income in because he too has absolutely no income in. So it's so one of the things we're going to be talking about is being conscious of, you know, what do you have to do to get through this? Um, and where can you be of service to others? Um, then when we talk about the stock market, uh, you can see how the S&P, Dow Jones, and NASDAQ have all fallen around 26, 28% across the board. And um, you guys, from my perception, we are going to go into a recession. I don't see how there's any way around it. Um, this is going to continue longer than a month. This is not going to be done in a month. I've been able to talk to people from the, um, the medical departments at Columbia Hospital, and this is going to last longer. I've also been told from multiple sources that they're not releasing all the information. And I honestly feel that's a good idea because people would start to panic. And um, it's more important that, that it's released slowly so that people can come to grips with it. But I'm just letting you know there's less money out there. When there's less money out there, that means real estate prices are going to come down and we need to prepare for that. So that's my overview. Um, we are now going to go to each one of our presenters and they're going to talk on a specific topic. So when we go to the next topic, Seth, if you could unmute your, your, your phone, and then let's have you take over. And Seth's going to talk about five stages of grief. Because the cu first couple speakers, we want to give you an overview, a sort of mental psychological overview on how to best position yourself uh, during this crisis. Go ahead, Seth. And Patrick, about how long do you want for each topic? Uh, you know, um, uh, let's say uh, five. Three, four to, minutes. Five minutes is good. Okay, great. great. Um, well, I don't, I don't think we'll, we'll take that long. I, I think, guys, as, as we're getting started on this, um, one thing I want to I want to bring a center to is the fact that uh, every person that is listening to this, every person in your life, every person you're related to right now is processing through grief in a really powerful way. And uh, and and every person I met, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm certain we, we share this in common. Uh, we're all dysregulated right now. And this is going to at such a primal level, right? When you go into a grocery store and you're like, I don't know if there's enough food for me, that is hitting a part of your brain that you haven't thought of for quite some time. When I when I drive by uh, restaurants, or shopping malls, and things are shut down, that's that is completely um, out of out of what I've experienced as a human being. Uh, except that it's it's so primal, like um, it still has the core feeling of we're dealing with grief. And I just want to remind all of us that, first off, we're of no good to the world around us until we recenter who we are. And we, you could have this conversation on a business level. We could simply have this conversation on a personal level. You've got to recenter who you are first for you to have an impact for your clients, for the teams that you lead, for those that you are trying to create a calming voice for. And and Patrick, thanks for kind of creating a, a, a calming space for, for this group here. So just as a reminder, like what are the five stages of grief? And so we'll list them briefly and then maybe we'll talk through them. It's it's denial, it's anger, it's burden, it's depression, and then it's acceptance. And, you know, I was interacting with a, a lot of clients uh, 
online, uh, one client in person, and then you know by text messages and phone calls over the weekend. And I just realized everybody deals with death differently, which is obviously a massive form of grief. And I realized every client is dealing with what's happening here in very different ways. Some of them and some agents are going as optimistic as they can, right? As quickly as they can, they're looking at the bright side of it. And they're kind of pissed off at everybody that is still, uh, that is, you know, dragging, dragging them down, so to speak. And other people are, are wanting to grieve longer. All of that is okay. Um, I, I just, I want us to get a, a, figure out what the life cycle is that each of our clients is going through and just help them along that process. In particular, I think, you know, Patrick, as we talk about a recession, what I am most concerned about happening is people hitting a point of depression and not moving forward in whatever action they need to take. And that action for some might mean take your house off the market, shift to a different tactic. That tactic, that action for others might be if you're going to sell, then we need to do what we need to do to get your property sold right now. And either way, people staying in the world of, I just wish it could go back to the way it was, is this is this bargaining and denial and just staying stuck in it. The, the faster that we get to acceptance, whatever that looks like, we're going to move through this process faster. And I, I guess if I could give one plea to everybody, it's be really, really gracious with how the world around you needs to react to this. Like however the people around you need to process through this, let them do that, including your team members, including your clients, and just keep being the voice of calm in the midst of it. And I'd like to add to what Seth just said in that um, different states are going to have different reactions. So if you're on one of the coasts, which has lots of luxury property where the stock market has really hit them hard, their net worths have dropped dramatically. I mean, dramatically for a lot of individuals. So the I, I believe those areas that have luxury properties are going to be hit harder. I don't think um, things in the Midwest are going to be hit as hard when um, their their pricing um, is so much more reasonable and that's not dependent upon the stock market as much. That being said, it will affect all areas of the country and there's always opportunity. I, during every recession that I've ever been in, I've been able to grow my business because I focus on what I needed to do to move my clients ahead, which was in their best interest. So, so don't look at a recession as a totally horrible thing. It's not a great thing, but don't look as a horrible thing because there is opportunity. And uh, we'll, we talked about recession, frankly, in the podcast that's up online this week. So Seth, anything else you wanna say? Well, no, just what you just said there reminded me of the the Warren Buffett quote, right? When when people are are greedy, be fearful, or when people are fearful, be greedy. And of course, none of us want to use the word that we're being greedy. How about just be proactive in whatever you're doing? And um, and yeah, you're you're absolutely right. Like there is suc- there is success, and there is life on the other side of this. And we've all got to pass through this journey in our own way. Um, I really want to be conscientious right now of what my clients are feeling and let them process that. I want to be conscientious of what my team is feeling and don't try and place my feelings on them or the way that I would process through this on them. It's, it's actually help them, uh, come through this on the other side for themselves. We've all got an individual journey here. Very well said, Seth. Thank you. Uh, Seth, if you could mute your mic and Lindsay, unmute yourself. And Lindsay's going to talk to us about vulnerability perspective and giving ourselves a reality check. Thanks, Patrick. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, I think vulnerability, I mean, I, I can only speak for myself, but I'm feeling extremely vulnerable right now. Um, and I have been for the last week, um, which is not a bad thing because, I mean, I guess there's a couple of points I jotted about uh, uh, relating to vulnerability and and really kind of exploring that. And one of them is, is really, I guess my first thought is to normalize what we're experiencing. So what we're going through is a, in, like for me personally, I've got a new work environment. I'm working out of my house. I've got a completely new schedule. I'm such a routine oriented person. My routine is completely off the chart. I'm in, into a new routine. Um, and also, I don't know where we're going or where we're going to end. So I try to normalize those new experiences. And then I guess what I thought about was just embrace the uncertainty because there's a ton of uncertainty out there right now. So embrace the uncertainty and the emotions 
And I, th I find it very, very, um, very valuable to name how I'm feeling, name the emotions and name the, uh, the uncertainty. And Patrick, you covered this so beautifully at the end of our, um, our week down in, in Guatemala about naming the, the emotions that you're going through. So I find that when you name the feelings or name the emotions, what we do is uh, we begin to own them. And as you own something, you, it becomes more power that you take on. And you know what? What I found out with the people around me is that if I own my own feelings and vulnerability and, and uncertainty, it empowers the people that are around me. The next thing is, is really put your issues into perspective. I mean, this is not going to last forever. Uh, we don't know how long it's going to last, but it's not going to last forever. Just try to be realistic with your own ex expectations. And if other people have unrealistic expectations, work with them to try to kind of just help them be a little bit more realistic about where what they're going through. And, and that could get back to just kind of having them embrace how they're feeling. And I guess really one of the other points is just, just do some real, reality checking for ourselves. Stay, I, I'm not going to say stay off Facebook, but really get your news from reliable sources. If you're going to take news about what's going on, just make sure that it's reliable sources that you're going to. Because one of the things I found about when uncertainty is introduced into the world, there's a whole bunch of snake oil salesmen that come out of the woodwork that want to pander certainty to you. And that can come up in really nasty ways. Um, that's kind of it. And like the last thing I, that uh, something I just heard Dr. Fred say was social distancing is not an act of fear. It's an act of love. Oh, really? That's a beautiful way of putting that. I really love that. That's really, mm. really beautiful. Lindsay, the other thing I want to bring up is, is on vulnerability. You know, vulnerability also resolves around your, um, revolves around your uh, beliefs. And if you believe, if you trust that the world is going to take care of you, that the universe or God is ultimately going to take care of you, it makes, it allows the feeling of vulnerability to be easier to process if you trust that everything's going to work out in the long run. I totally agree. I think that, um, I mean, it's that, that abundance mentality. Um, so, I mean, this is so easy right now. If you are feeling so vulnerable about where you are, it's so easy to slip into scarcity. And I think that if you look at the abundance, and I mean, a couple of points that I, I've heard over the last 24 hours is whenever things go through a black swan, well, like we're going through right now, there is so much opportunity out there. But if you are uncertain, if you're dealing in scarcity, you miss all of the opportunities. And to be honest with you, the opportunity that exists for you may be just helping out the neighbors on your street if they're, they're stressed. So whatever that opportunity is, I really believe that if you deal with a, an abundance mentality, those opportunities will present themselves to you. Um, excellent. Well said. Um, Jenny, just to let you know, I finally found you and your mic should be live. And then if you could mute yourself for the time being, that'd be great, Jenny. Um, and you can, if you have trouble figuring it out, Dawn can help you. Uh, let's move on. Thanks, Lindsay. Let's mute you. Debbie, can you unmute yourself? And, you know, boy, Debbie and I have been friends for a long, long time. And she's a, she and I got into coaching together. And one of the things that she's really focused on is leadership. So she's the perfect person to be talking to us about this. So Deb. Hey, Patrick, thanks. So you know that I live by this quote, success comes to those who get in front of the inevitable. And so we have an opportunity right now to make some adjustments. The thing I wanna remind everybody about very first and foremost is that you're a leader. You have to lead yourself first, and then you lead your clients, you lead your family, you lead your team. And if you don't have team that, that are admin people or, or agents working with you, you have a team with lenders, with title company people, with inspectors, with appraisers. You are the leader of other realtors in your community who may not have gone through any sort of a shift like this. And finally, you're a leader for your community. And so I want everybody to embrace that philosophy and see, are you showing up with your best? Are you showing up with your best for yourself, first of all? And <clears throat> I'm 
you know, this is my fourth industry ship. Patrick, we've been friends for a long time. I've been in the business a long time. And as I think back about through all of those different challenges that we've had in the marketplace, there have been good things that come out of every one of them. And so the initial initial reaction is often fear and shutting down and, and going through, through grief. Um, I'm happy to say that in every one of those three prior industry shifts, we found a way to increase our market share. And so can you, if you're serving your clients. So for us um, in central Arizona, our marketplace is different than you're going to find in metros. We're having the busiest month of March that we've had in three years. Um, we're practicing, you know, safe showing procedures. And, and I'm even afraid to use that word safe because people are so on edge these days that any word you say can be taken one way or the other. Pretty much across the board, I'm seeing three reactions to this. One is people are devastated, they're fearful, they're at home or they're in the stores or looking in the stores for toilet paper. You know, they're hoarding, they're just going into scarcity and fear. Um, they're catastrophizing, they're watching the news nonstop, they're on social media. Everybody they talk to, they raise the fear level a little bit more because we're either contributing positively to a conversation or we're contaminating it. And so different parts of the country and different parts of the world are going to experience this differently. And so I, I believe it's important that we really look at how we're leading ourselves. So the other thing I see is, is you know, in this first group is people on social media shaming other business owners because they're not experiencing as much of a loss as they are. We as leaders need to be careful about our messaging. You know, the second group of people I'm seeing are saying, hey, great, it's a two or three week vacation. I'm just going to hang out at home. I'm going to watch videos. I'm having virtual happy hours. I'm just having a blast. I'm just, I love this couple weeks of time off. And you know what? I'm going to, well, it'll be business as usual in a couple weeks. And I think those people just haven't faced what's really going on. The third group of people, and it's a much smaller group, are ones that are preparing for industry change. They're saying, how can I learn from this? What can I put in place to actually help people and move forward in the world? And so, you know, they're mastering new technology. They're calling people and listening to, to how they are and talking to them. They're not adding their opinions. I'm not an economic expert. I am absolutely not a health expert. So when I'm talking to people, I'm asking, how are you? Do you need anything? Is there anything we can do for you? but I am not adding to the noise. And I think that's really important as a leader. What are you putting out there? Are you contributing to the conversation, to the positive attitude, or are you contaminating? So for me, one of the first things for me last week, as this really started, as we started making significant changes in the way we're doing business in, in our company here, was to say, how am I handling stress personally? So knowing the DISC personality types and knowing that I'm a super high D under pressure, I know that I um, want to get even more effective and efficient and save time. And so for me, I've found that I have been irritated with people that are, you know, group two, that are just having a good time, sending videos, doing this, because they're interfering with my need to get things done and my, my wish to get things changed and, and focused for how we're going to move forward with this. And so as a high D, I, I had to notice that and say, is that the kind of leader I want to be? Do I want to be so stressed myself that I have no room for compassion? You know, eyes, if you're a high I, you know how you deal with things. You, you seek fun and entertainment. And so a lot of eyes are talking, 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 talking. And so that's fine. That's how you deal with stress. Just be aware of how you, you handle stress and how you interact with others. S's tend to get quiet, put their heads down. If we're not careful, they can disappear. So do you have people in your life that are S's? As a leader, how are you engaging with them? And then C's, um, they're very procedure oriented. They like stats, they like specifics. Those people can get lost in the numbers too and the statistics because they're kind of scary. So 
I have to say, what kind of a leader do you want to be? How are you leading yourself first? And then how are you showing up in the world? Um, I have to say, we're looking for ways to get positive, positive messaging out into our community. I know there's people on Facebook that are organizing restaurants that still have drive through or takeout service. Um, we participated in that sidewalk chalking event, um, that message to send out where people can take chalk out and they write positive messages on their sidewalks um, to give a little cheer to people as they're walking around. Um, we're, we're promoting a Community Choice Teacher of the Year contest right now, um, giving people something fo positive to focus on. So remember that as a leader, you're sending out your energy to the world. And remember that what we focus on expands. So are you focusing on abundance and faith or are you focusing on fear and scarcity? It's energetic body odor. Even if you're not saying the words, you're putting that energy out there. So check yourself and check what kind of a leader you want to be. Thank oh, you, Patrick. I, I, Debbie, Debbie, I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that one yet. Energetic body odor. That's hysterically funny. You know, Debbie just demonstrated a great leadership trait and that everybody else who has spoken so far has too. Is that if you notice their tone is calm and realistic and upbeat, and they're not bringing more drama to the table. And that's what one of the aspects of a really good leader, in my opinion. So thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Patrick. John, Debbie, if you could mute, please. John, could you unmute? And John Smith is going to talk about some procedure, policy, and contractual changes that we need to consider. Good stuff there, Debbie. Uh, last week in Pennsylvania, it was a normal week. Uh, daffodils were blooming. The buds on the cherry trees were starting to come out, and it was just a fantastic week. Our spring market was really busy, and all of a sudden, Wednesday hit, last Wednesday hit, and we had a buyer who had just lost his job. We were going to do a settlement on Friday. And uh, I called up the other agent and he said, I'm sorry, but we got a denial letter because he had just lost his job on Tuesday. Uh, that reality hit immediately. And on Friday, our governor, Governor Tom Wolf, came out and stated that real estate is not a is a non-life sustaining business. There were five pages of that he came out with where there were businesses. Uh, insurance business is able to conduct business right now. So John, John, let's not because Pennsylvania, we don't want to go into any one specific state, but let's talk about some of the things that Pennsylvania and you're doing that they may see happen in other states. I think that would be a good yeah. way to go from there. Uh, okay. Uh, our Pennsylvania Association of Realtors are very active in trying to address Go uh, Governor Wolf and making some changes. Uh, one of the things are they are appealing that they reclassify real estate as a self-sustaining um, business. Uh, the other thing that we are very much in contact with is the fact that uh, PAR has shared many articles with us. Uh, the landing page includes the Pennsylvania government order, transaction forms. So we're changing, we're seeing procedures change. Uh, there is a form that, that Pennsylvania Association of Realtors came out that, that you all may be faced with as well. And it's a form that automatically extends with both buyer and seller agreeing to settlement date, other dates uh, for a 30 day period. And this is a form that just came out last week. And uh, it's a, how is that? How is that form? How's that? So that's a contractual change. It's an addendum, I assume. How is yeah. that addendum being presented to um, both the seller and the buyer? Okay, we are um, as currently right now. The, the things that we have in the pipeline, they are going to settlement. Uh, we see possible extensions coming up because in certain situations. Um, appraisers may not be able to get into a home. They are actually doing uh, drive-bys now because many, uh, depending on the uh, mortgage company, they are not allowing it, but it's not a state law yet or a state uh, procedure, but many 
uh, mortgage companies are not allowing them to come go into homes, so they're allowing drive-by appraisals. So I think... But who, who, can... who brings up the contractual change? Is it the real estate broker in Pennsylvania, or does an attorney do it, or how does that happen? Uh, it's actually the Pennsylvania Association of Realtors. Uh, they, they, they're the ones who are recognizing that they're there are going to be contractual changes. Now, after the 30 day period, you both parties have to agree to extend it even more than that. But at the same time, parties can make these contracts void and therefore, um, you know, the contracts would be void. And so I think, I think one of the things that we're going to see from this going on down the road is that just about everything's going to be negotiable and that everything will be renegotiated and that we're going to have to be prepared that uh, sometimes to save a deal, we're going to have to go back and renegotiate things or they're going to die. And when if people get really short on money, things like like if you have an owner who has um, uh, 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 investment properties where he's collecting rent and the people can't pay the rent, you're going to have to go back and negotiate every single thing on a case by case basis. It's not going to be a standardized thing. Would you agree with that, John? Yeah, I totally. And one of the things buyer and seller acknowledge that they are required to make a good faith effort to satisfy all the terms and that a failure to do so may be deemed a breach of a, a contract and the agreement. And therefore uh, we're going to have to be the best negotiators possible. And, We've had um, people that are coming in from out of town that are, uh, I, here's a good example, and you might be faced with this. We have a, a really nice bed and breakfast for sale over in Hershey, and we can't show the property. We, we as realtors cannot physically be in contact with any buyer or seller. So they were coming up from Virginia, and we actually we contacted our seller and so we're putting the buyer and seller together, which is, I know, not a good business sense, but at the same time, they both wanted to, to do it. And so I've been in communication with the other realtor, the co-broke, and so we're making it happen that way. Is it ideal? No, but we are showing that. Benefit. Actually, I'm going to disagree with you. It is ideal in these circumstances. In fact, it's creative and it's thoughtful and it's looking out for for everybody's best interests within the statutes that the state is providing. I actually think it's brilliant. Well, thank you very much for that comment. And here's the other thing is that we have to close. And again, I'm just pointing out what you all might be faced with. And it's a blessing if you're able to continue to sell real estate and conduct business as is. But uh, right now we are possibly um, could possibly get a fine jail time and actually a suspension of license in the event that we are um, uh, caught and they have the police force out in-person meetings such as showings open houses inspections are prohibited and so it's a very very serious thing here in pennsylvania and again it might be something that you all may be faced with eventually yeah, so it's just good that you're hearing these things, even though Pennsylvania, New York, and California are a lot stricter than the rest of the country. That doesn't mean that it can't come here and here can't come to you. And it may not come to you, but hearing these things ahead of time can help prepare you to give you the edge up so that you're not shocked and you're able to deal with the third group like Debbie was talking about. John, thank you. That was really good. I appreciate that. Sure. Uh, anything else you want to say, John? I guess that was no. Okay. Brian, uh, Brian, unmute yourself. Talk to us about messaging. Am I being heard? Yes, sir. All right. Perfect. Patrick, um, this is the third crisis that I'm going to be going through as part of your group. The first was 9-11. I remember shortly after the Twin Towers fell, we were in a hotel in New York looking out the window at the holes in the ground where they used to be. The second was the financial crisis, which began in 2008, and now this. And while this one is, is unique, um, I'm confident that the information that I learn from this group is not only going to help me get through this process, but help me get through it with the optimal results possible, and it's already begun. Now, 
one of the things that I've been, um, you know, focused on is the proper messaging to clients. And, you know, the first thing I decided there was going to be no BS and no BS means, you know, no woohoo sales statements, no celebrations of any kind, but it also, we need to tell clients that the market isn't going to zero. And unless we form and share that conclusion with the clients, they might think it is going to zero. You know, for example, you know, over the course of the past seven days, my team and I have had six transactions. We are not going to have six transactions in the next week. But I shared the six transaction information, you know, with, with the folks who I'm working with right now. And I've also shared that our brokerage has had 35 transactions over the course of the past seven days. And that number, well, it's, it's going to go down, um, is a fact and a conclusion and goes to my expertise. And I think it's extremely important. I think it's a paramount important that we only speak to items in which we have expertise. You all know from looking at your inboxes over the past week that any business or service that has ever had your email address is sending out some COVID-19 messaging. And, you know, the majority of them aren't worth reading because, A, they're t you know, I'm, I'm having a, a health club giving me tips on how to wash my hands which is not their expertise. And it looks like it was written by the public relations department inside their phone. So in addition to the messaging being, you know, expert, it has to be, it has to be authentic as, as well. And it has to, it has to come from you. Um, I think that this is a temporary problem. It, I th I'm looking at this not as a housing problem, but as a healthcare crisis. And I'm pointing to the fact that in our market specifically, there had been, you know, a 14% increase in sales activity year over year before this event occurred. And I think with the new stimulus package that's going to be put in place, that there's going to be significantly greater liquidity in the financing uh, that didn't exist in 2008. That was the number one problem in the solutions toward the 2008 financial crisis. It took too long for the Fed to react and insert liquidity into the market. Ryan, that, Ryan, that's a really good point. Could you go into that into a little more detail, please? Yeah, in fact, it was a case where, um, you know, one of the concerns that the Fed had last time was that they didn't want to provide too much help too fast because they were concerned about Citizen A being frustrated that Citizen B got help and they didn't, okay? Secondarily, they took too long before they made these types of decisions. And the Fed has already committed to not making those types of problems this time around. In fact, they've stated that they're going to err on the side of over overreacting in a positive way. Um, and, and, for those re and for those reasons, um, you know, I think if we all you know, do what we can do, which is shelter in place, which is the law uh, in Illinois right now, that this could be, you know, a problem of shorter term than many of us are thinking. Excellent. Anything else, Brian? No. That's good. Listen, I'm going to, before I bring Dawn on, um, Dan Voringer just left a little, uh, under the Q&A, left a, a really nice post. Dan, what I'm going to ask you to do is to, on the Rev uh, Facebook group, is to go in and repeat what you said there because what Dan, uh, Dan would like to see is how are other people embracing out of the box ideas to deal with the situation? He would find that to be helpful. That would be a great post. And if you can do that on the Rev, pod, uh, the Rev Facebook group, that would be great, Dan. All right, Brian, thank you so much. Dawn, will you uh, unmute? Hi. Hello, everybody. Dawn Thomas here. Um, so I live in California, which is the state that basically came out of the gates with the strictest policies possible first. So we've been sheltering in place for a long time. However, the good news is, is we're still, you know, doing deals. Uh, properties that were already active are still going into contract. We're going to probably see a pretty sharp decline, though, in April closed sales. But uh, for instance, the week of um, March 9th through uh, uh, the 15th, to the 16th through just yesterday, we saw a 39% decline in new active listings. 
Um, and I think what everybody's doing in, in our area, at least in Silicon Valley, from what I can see on our top agent network kind of po you know, uh, forums is that people are waiting until four, you know, April 7th, literally probably at noon is when our mandate is over um, in our state. But nonetheless, I'm here to talk to you guys about sphere of influence and social media. Um, so I'm a Tony Robbins buff. I've been in Platinum Partners. Seth Daly is part of that as well, as well as some other people in our rev group. And the other day, um, truthfully, I did it because I really needed it, but I posted it uh, a post that said, tell me something positive that is going on for you right now. And it wasn't tell me something that's happening to you right now because Tony Robbins teaches that life happens for you, not to you. And I'm still getting people responding to that. I mean, right now, there's been over 250 people that have commented. People have sent me messages privately saying, thank you so much for being a bright light and being, you know, really positive attitude. Um, and I, I, you know, that's, that's what I've been trying to do. Some other people have, have already said, you know, your messaging and being a leader out there and, and just being a voice of positivity and calmness in the face of what, you know, is, could be said as panic in the country is super duper important here. Um, like Brian already said, and just for the record, Brian and I are both super high Ds. He's probably more of a high D than me, even though I score 99 on D, but also 99 on I um, in the disc profile. Um, I have been unsubscribing right and left. If I see COVID-19 in the subject line, I uns unsubscribe immediately because it's making me nuts. So what we've done in terms of marketing for our database, you know, obviously there's various different types of marketing. Um, and I have um, follow up boss as my CRM with a bunch of campaigns written by Happy Grasshopper for various different audiences is that we've stopped all messaging for real estate to prospects because that's not what they're thinking about right now. As multiple people have said, they're thinking about their, you know, up to 30% losses in their portfolios. Silicon Valley is hugely um, reliant upon, you know, people with RSUs and, and down payments and those and those veins. And so they don't want to, they don't want to hear from us. So when we think it's appropriate to resume those types of prospecting emails and messaging, we will. Um, however, for current buyers and sellers that we already have, that we already are engaged with, you know, we'll send them market information that's true and solid and data driven, like, like Brian said, um, you know, and for properties that we have coming on market, we have a beautiful farmhouse, modern farmhouse coming in, uh, San Jose area. Um, we're putting scheduling showings for April 7th, starting at 1 PM and spots are filling up fast. You know, we're just trying to be as positive as possible to let our, our current clients know we are still working on their behalf to get their property sold if they're currently already listed and on the multiple listing service. We're not being an ostrich and sticking our head in the sand. And we're trying to still be very, very positive with, you know, our, you know, our messaging out there on social media. Um, you know, the whole thing with sphere of influence is, um, right now, more than ever, you know, if you talk about, again, something that we've learned from Tony Robbins, the six human uh, needs are love and connection is number one, significance, certainty, uncertainty, growth, and um, basically philanthropy, you know, how we contribute. And, and right now, love and connection is what everybody needs out there. And I would strongly encourage you, if you have not been picking up the phone, please do so. Um, and just reach out. You never know when you're going to make a difference in somebody's life right now. And reach out not for a sales call, reach out for a connection call, correct? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. No, real estate. Hey, I don't even bring it up. I'll just say, you know, we're all going through a tough time right now. And I'm trying to reach out to let you know, I'm thinking of you. And if there's something that I can help you with, you know, if it's just to listen um, you know, whatever the case may be, I want to, I want to know, I'm, I've been doing this guys to even colleagues that are actual, uh, competitors of mine in my, in my own marketplace, because I know that they're having a hard time. It could be a single mom with three kids that, you know, that who knows what's going to happen to her financially. I, I just don't want to see anybody left behind is my thing. I really am trying to make a difference from a positive perspective in as many people's lives as I can right now. 
Um, and, you know, and to me, that's what matters. One of the things you said, Dawn, that I really liked was suppose you're bringing and you said, you know, about scheduling an open house for um, April the 7th. You know, if you have some sellers that that especially in your states like Illinois, New York um, or Pennsylvania, and you're you want to bring a well, maybe not Illinois, but you want to bring a property on, maybe send it out coming to the market soon. Um you can start making appointments now for then. And then if the if the non-essential ban hasn't been lifted in your state by then, then you can just reschedule it. But it's a way to sort of build up interest. I really like that. I really like that, Dawn. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, Paul, will you unmute yourself, please? And Paul um, uh, is going to talk about working with sellers. Patrick, nice to see you. Nice, to, nice to see me. I can't see you, but I can see your name. That's about it. Hey, Paul. Good to be here. I'm calling in from Massachusetts. And um, this has been great to hear everybody so far. So thank you. Um, one thing I want to, to talk about is just to make sure that we all remember that this will pass and business does go on and people always need to buy and always need to sell. And always remember the work that we do. And Patrick, you and I have talked about this. The work that we do, it really is noble work. And I think probably most people who are listening would agree with that because we've been in the business, so many of us, for a long time. But what we do and what we contribute and how we help people in really major turning points in their lives. So if we can be there for our sellers right now, it's... It's almost doing the same thing that we always should be doing. We should be in touch with them. We should be a trusted advisor to them. We should be hand-holding and listening to them. Um, I think that in, in some cases that the sellers are actually going to be surprised. If we reach out individually to sellers, and I agree with what everybody has been said, I don't, I don't think this is the time to be doing mass mailings and and, and um, promoting real estate. But if we reach out to them as individuals and talk to them and hear what they're thinking, um, then, then we are doing our job. And I think that in some cases, they'll be surprised to be hearing from us because they think, in many cases, they think, well, nothing's going on at all in real estate. So to hear from the real estate broker is meaningful. Um, Absolutely. How about price reductions? Well, you know, um, Next to selling a house, getting a price reduction has always been one of my um, favorite things to do in real estate because I really believe priced properly, I can sell anything. And if it's overpriced, then I can't. So um, I'll be the first to admit that I regularly have a supply of overpriced listings. So if I can use this as an opportunity to help a seller help themselves by reducing the price, then that will be my goal. I think that um, I think that real estate prices are going to come down. I don't know how much they're going to come down, but I think they're going to come down. And what I've last learned from previous crisis periods, I've seen people over and over, sellers drop a price and then have to drop it again and then again. And it was always too little, too late. And so if I can convince a seller that this is the time to make a meaningful price change and to do it quickly, because I think we're in this for a while. And if the buyer pool has diminished, and if, and if, and if a buyer is looking at 10 listings in a certain price range in my market area, I think there's a good chance that the one that goes is going to be the one that's the best value. Yeah, so, you know. Paul, I when uh, we had that thing in 2008, 2009, but 2008 when the I forget it was it was Lehman Brothers or Goldman Sachs, I forget which. Um, when that happened, that happened in August. By October, it was really dead in New York in terms of sales. And I went out to all of my my uh, sellers, and we we decided that about 90% of my listings we were going to lower them by 12 and a half percent. Now I just picked that number out of the air. Um, but it seemed it's on a gut level, it seemed like a good idea. 90% of my listings bought into that. 
And they all sold within that month of October. I did like seven deals. And at my price point, that's a lot of deals in, in October. But the point is, is by the time the market had fully fallen by January, prices had come down 23%. So if this is a scenario where this is going to happen, if you take advantage early and talk can talk to your clients about that, you might be doing them a huge favor. I think so. And time will tell. But I think you will look back, they will look back and say, wow, how fortunate were we that you advised us to make this adjustment now instead of waiting. Anything else with sellers, Paul? Um, you know, I think in terms of real connection with them, I think, now I, I reached out to a, a seller this morning, a seller who had given me a, a book at Christmas and The Second Mountain, and I've been reading it. And so I reached out to her first thing this morning and said, just, just in reading your book, and I'm thinking of you and just, you know, just to connect person to person, because as we've said er early on, what, what our business is about, it's about people, it's about relationships, it's about connection. So um, I think that's, I think that's planting the, the seeds or laying the groundwork for future business, but it's, it's really genuine. It's from the heart, just caring about people and reaching out to them. Thanks, my friend. James Nellis. James is going to talk to us about working with buyers and showing procedures. Patrick, how you doing, buddy? Good, 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 good. Long time no talk. It must be at least an hour. <laughs> I love it. And I, I love that you talked about listings before buyers and you were talking about the relationships. I think it's interesting in, in my experience over 25 years, I think it's easier to have a deeper relationship with the buyer because you're with them consistently. They're in your car, they're following you or whatever. And so you asked me to kind of share about... <laughs> If you can, what does it mean to quote unquote safely show and things like that? So let's talk about interaction with the buyers. I think it's easier for a seller to say, yeah, virtual makes a lot of sense. Let's do it. Then to a buyer that says, hey, buy this for a million dollars. You're never going to see it, right? There's a, <laughs> it's a little bit easier for the sellers to take it on. Uh, a couple things to think through. I'll get through kind of the basics and then circle back. Showings. All of our agents, when they go out to show and they've been doing this since it first emerged, have gloves sanitizers, booties that they change out and don't keep with them, uh, and sanitizers for their phones. You know, that's the challenge, Patrick. A lot of times you're doing virtual showings for your clients and you're touching your phone, you're touching other surfaces, and now it's on your phone. Uh, I'll post it on the Rev. There was a very good portrayal of uh, the virus being like glitter on a doorknob and where does it go? Uh, I'll, I'll share that rather than taking the time for it. So the things to think about is also – we put up a health questionnaire. If you go to nellisgroup.com forward slash health, it's a Google form. And before any of my clients were going to show a property, we made the buyers go on and basically go through the health questionnaire that we all saw circulating. Um, we only allow tight people that are going to be on title to be at the showings. We don't have, you know, and we certainly don't say don't bring your kids, but we just say if they're going to be on title, they can be there at the showing. We push for virtual showings more than anything. And a lot of our buyers have taken us up on that where one of our agents will go and actually FaceTime them or take them through the property all virtually. And then if they are there, uh, we encourage separate levels. So they, they let the clients go, then they go, and, and they're never really on the same level at the same time. Some of our agents have decided that they'll walk through the property, then they'll come back out and let the clients walk through the property. Uh, and we have a no touch policy. We encourage our clients to not touch anything. They get gloves as well, but you really just don't know what's going on there. Um, the 3D tours have helped a lot. The floor plans help, of course. We do have that addendum for the COVID-19 and all of that. Um, that's just the simplicity of showings in today's world, Patrick. And I know in some states you can't even show. So that's, that's a whole other dynamic. But if you're listening to this and you're a state that can show, my encouragement is just to be OCD about everything. Just understand that you're there to protect yourself and them. You know, one of the questions I had for my own executive team, Patrick, was when do I push, they're independent contractors, but when do I push for my agents to not show anymore, right? I mean, there's, as a leader, and Debbie talked about it earlier, as a leader, there's there's something on me to say, hey, you should or shouldn't be doing this, right? They could choose to do what they want. Um, and then I will say this, Patrick, I'm getting a lot of calls from top agents and in my own buyers who are calling right now, they're under contract, and they're asking that question. Should I buy? Should I walk away? And I'm seeing some people walk away. And so I came up with what I consider like the five keys of 
it really helps. I'll try to I'll try to post that rather than taking up a ton of time. But uh, I think it's important to think through, uh, and it's really quick. Number one is reserves. Do you have it for three to four months? Number two is interest rates. Are you at four percent or below? Number three is security. Could you see yourself losing your job in the next hundred and twenty days? Number four is ownership. It's what we always teach. You know, five to seven years. Number five, of course, is the mortgage taxes. You know, the fact that you get to take that deduction. And I just think it's very important to to reach out to your buyers that are under contract right now to make certain that they're making the best decisions for themselves and that they fall underneath those five keys. And I really like what you just said. First of all, thank you for posting all that on the Facebook group, James. That's great. One of the things that um, I really think that a good leader does is that um, they don't tell people what to do. They, they consult and give reasons why they think a certain way, but ultimately they let their team person or their buyer or their seller make their own decision because everybody needs to feel empowered on this. So what, what is acceptable for one buyer's agent on following your procedures may not be, may be too risky for another agent and they should have the right to choose to do what they want to do, given the scenarios, after you explain what you prefer. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, let me touch on just this one thing really quick. A lot of people are talking about what do you do when you call people? What does that look like and who do you call? Um, we have right now our rule of four, who to call. You know me, I have to have like an acronym or letters or something like that. So for us, who to call, the top four is active adults, the people that probably can't get out shouldn't be going out, the people that are alone, the people in an apartment or high rises and anyone with a new baby. And then our focus is be, pre you know, be present, be positive, be the resource, be the guide, and then be of service. And, and I think this will correspond with everybody on the call. Our, our four for be of service is pick up food, medicine, and diapers for people if you can. Conversation, have a positive word for them. Have a fun Netflix or Prime movie that they could watch and even suggest a podcast or a book. So really just being of service to our people and, and calling with the right message. Awesome. And I just want to interrupt. Thank you, James, as always. You always present very well. Um, I just want to, one of the questions that was asked by Wade George is, um, if, if the next two to three months are likely to create downtime, how can we leverage the free time to evaluate personnel process, marketing assets, and weaknesses? I think that's brilliant, brilliant question. And Wade, I would like you to, if you're not, I don't, I think you're in our Facebook group. If not, just go into it. Uh, I'll sign you up. And would you, Wade, would you please post that? And um, because I think that's a really good conversation to people to have within the Facebook group. But I really like that question a lot. Thanks, James. Jennifer, do you want to unmute yourself? Hey, my love. Yeah. Hi, yes, darling. How are you? I'm good. So Jenny's in uh, in Chicago, and um, you, I'd like you to talk. You know, there's specific concerns for co-ops and condos, which are different from showing just a house and any other sure. things. And you know, like there's like uh, HOAs and that sort of thing. So, what are your thoughts, Jenny? So, so first of all, I just want to clarify that our governor did issue a stay-in-place order last Friday. It was effective Saturday, and it runs for a little over two weeks. And unlike some of the states, our stay in place order does acknowledge that real estate is an essential service and it, and it allows movers, appraisers, inspections and things. So one of the concerns that a lot of people have, of course, is that if you've got a home under contract and they live in a condo building or a co-op, you know, would they be able to move out and vacate in order to close on time? Our banks and our title companies are open for business. They don't, they've, they've modified it. The title companies don't let the agents in. They're, you know, it's only essential people. And so they're trying to minimize contact. They're, you know, mailing out the checks and the RESPAs. But the bottom line is that the governor was really thoughtful in carving out a provision that allows us to continue to do our jobs. Having said that, we have run into a situation where many of the buildings, the high-rise buildings, condos and co-ops, and I and I assume it's probably the case with rental buildings as well, have said visitors under any circumstances are allowed in the buildings, only residents. And so we've, in the last week or so, we've had agents in our company go to do showings 
and basically been turned away at the door. In some cases, our clients are not even notified. And last night, we had a doorman say that an appraiser was not going to be allowed access. So we had to write a letter to the property manager citing the governor's, the provisions in this, the governor's order that that appraiser needs to have access in otherwise it could jeopardize our ability to close on time which would cause financial hardship to our client um, many of the buildings are creating rules like one person in the elevator at a time or um, you know only the the one person's allowed in like the buyer or the appraiser not the agent so we're actually today buildings present Understand. Jenny, you're you're going in and out. Oh. Was, we're losing connection with oh. you, Jenny. Uh, in the microphone, it might be the internet here. Okay, that's better. I, uh, can, I can hear you now. Okay, thank you. So, bottom line is, we are taking it on a case by case basis for unoccupied single family homes, we are still doing, you know, and it's a case by case basis with the agents. We have some people who absolutely are not leaving their house. And we have others who said, I want to, you know, continue to try and make a living and they are doing showings, definitely no open houses. Uh, we're doing a lot of our showings, again, virtually or uh, letting them in, but not walking through ourselves but we, it's uncharted territory with the condos and we're just trying to figure out uh, what we can do and not do. Uh, yeah, but for before, new listings, before the restrictions came down on us, our firm decided that if you were going to do an open house, it had to be a by appointment only and only one buyer in at a time. Yeah, that's, I've seen that in, in several um, places where people have basically posted at the door of the open house. You can't come in if you're sick, one at a time, you know, thoughtful things like that. But we decided that it's not responsible right. to really do them uh, and prefer to do things by appointment. But we also understand that people need to, you know, balance their health, but also if they've got sellers that need to sell, we, you know, how do you handle the fiduciary question of serving them? And we're, discovering that we're all way more creative than we ever realized through our ability to do things on social media, to do things with video and FaceTime. And I love that we're bringing that out. I hope that that stays with us, you know, as we move forward, you know, beyond this crisis. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Jenny. Anything else? No, I think that covers it for now. Thank you, Patrick, for organizing this. Oh, my pleasure. Um, before we move on, Catherine Burnett just said, I can't find the Rev Facebook on um, the uh, on, on Facebook. Uh, Catherine, just uh, uh, mess, uh, you message me, so I'll be able to get back to you. If anybody else can, if you're not a friend with me on Facebook, make me a friend. I'm Patrick Vernon Lilly. And then, and ask to be on the Rev book, and I'll invite the Rev Facebook book, and I'll invite you to that, so you'll be able to get in. All right, Jenny, mute yourself. Lee, can you uh, start? Bring yourself Bring online. Yourself. All right. Hello, friends. Now. Hey, my, hey, my bread. So if anybody's going to talk about legislative policy and what we can do, it is this woman, Lee Brown. Hey, buddy. Okay. So first of all, before I talk policy and legislative stuff, you've got to do what Howard Brenton told us every time he taught, get out of judgment and into curiosity. Now is not the time for partisan fights or opinions that are D digging into your R or your D person. Right now, we're looking at how we serve our communities and how we take care of so many different angles here. So I'm going to bring to y'all what we're doing as a National Association of Realtors. Obviously, you know what's happening with different states and with your locals. Y'all, there has never been a more visible explanation for us of why our associations exist and why our political advocacy efforts matter because the amount of work that our lobbyists are accomplishing on all levels of government right now is unprecedented and without the work that they're doing you wouldn't even see these 
what we consider small carve outs for essential services on real estate. And so your RPAC dollars are visibly at work. And if you have who's avoided investing in the PAC in the past because you didn't agree with it or you don't like money in politics, I'm going to tell you that the salaries it's paying for right now are saving people's lives because housing is health care. And I will tell y'all that the comments have been made earlier about the levels of depression that are coming and we're going to see a, a lot of issues arise. But there's data for decades showing that people who have a safe and secure place to live of some sort, they are more likely to be healthy, stable in their jobs, stable children, stable futures. We know that's how important housing is and all of its different efforts. And so I implore you to please be involved more than you've ever been involved because the work is critical. I'm going to give you all some resources where you can get information. If you go to realtorparty.realtor, that is the primary website for the National Association's members regarding our political advocacy work. It's being updated frequently. So that's realtorparty.realtor. If you've never invested in our efforts, now's the time to make that commitment. The Another place you can get information is if you are a connected volunteer then we have information available at thehub.realtor. That's T-H-E-H-U-B dot Realtor. Not everyone has access to that, but if you get connected to your local association and your state leadership, they can help you with that. And I will tell y'all, if you've never been involved, there's no better time. And Debbie Yost can speak to that better than anybody after many years of her just being number one at the world and everything. She dove in to save her MLS from people who don't understand how critical it is to understand how the data feed impacts things. That being said, let me give you all some quick legislative updates for what's going on that you need to know about. Today, we had an announcement from FHFA, the Federal Housing and Finance Agency, that there is mortgage forbearance for multifamily investors. This is huge, y'all. And any of you that have investors, this is a phone call you need to make to them pronto. The condition that is being made is that if they are waiving evictions and waiving rent for their tenants in multifamily, if it's a mortgage that's backed by the FHA entities, Fannie and Freddie, the mortgage holder will be able to get forbearance. And what we had seen previously was if you're going to give all this relief to the tenants, that's fantastic. But if the property owner has notes to cover, are you going to help them? And the answer is yes. And so that's a huge win as of today. We are currently waiting on guidance for the single family investors, and we expect to have that very shortly. Of course, there's no promises on anything as to when it's going to come out, but they're working as quickly as they can. And so you're going to see single family investors have some forbearance there as well if they have tenants who can't make payments because of coronavirus challenges. So that is one of our wins today. Let me make my checklist here. The other giant win that we've had because of the challenges with real estate as an essential service. And as we know, it's not just us as realtors, it's our inspectors, our appraisers, all of the affiliated companies and vendors that rely on us and that our clients rely on. FHFA has said that they are going to relax the restrictions on appraisers and for verification of employment. So your VOEs are going to have an easier way to get approved. Your appraisals are going to have more allowance for desktop appraisals to keep appraisers from having to go into houses and be exposed. That's huge. Oh, let's see. Next one I have is your, oh, by the way, those relaxations on appraisal and VOE are for FHFA notes. That is not FHA, but we do expect some guidance on FHA very soon. That's what they're working on next. So expect that announcement in the next, I would guess, 48 to 72 hours because I feel confident we're going to get a yes there. If you weren't aware, your tax deadline has moved to July. And as independent contractors who are going to have to very carefully watch your cash reserves right now, that's a blessing. So make sure that if you have entrepreneur clients or I mean pretty much any client, let them know that if there's somebody who traditionally pays taxes because they don't want the government to hold their money, that they've got an extension. And I'm going to remind y'all too, that as I'm giving you some stuff to talk about in phone calls, I'm 100% in the camp of 
when I call people, it's literally, hey, you doing I? Y'all cool over there. It's not to dive into this, but as a very high D person, I've got a lot of clients that are wired like me and they really don't give a shit about the the little stuff that's going on. They really just want some information. And I'm totally cool with that. And so I'll just find out what's going on, ask them if you want some information. Because our job, y'all, and my new hashtag that I'm pushing out there is be the resource. And so your job right now as a realtor is to be the resource. And as members of the world's largest grassroots organization with an unmatched amount of impact, your job is to make sure that you're utilizing the information that we have as an association to let people know that we're working for them. Because when they're panicked, they sometimes just need to know that somebody's out there being proactive and who has their back in some regard. That's what we do. And that's what our organization is doing. Even if you are unsure what's happening in your life, you can give some reassurance to others. And that's also how that abundance piece lives out. It's not just abundance financially. It's also abundance with information and with caring about the impact on others a little more than yourself. The comment made over here by Debbie, I will give the link that's being updated um, as we get information. I'll put that in the Rev Facebook group, Debbie. So I'll make that easy for everybody. I made myself a note there. So back to what else we are doing. Um, the extension on 1031s is in process. We have a lot of clients nationally who are in the middle of a 1031 and now they don't know how they're going to be able to identify and close on a replacement property. If you are a 1031 agent, just stay tuned because we are very proactively working on that because as y'all know, the commercial sector stands to take a far bigger hit than the residential sector as we go into some kind of a recession, no matter how long lived it is, that service industry is going to see a lot of shuttering of business. So the commercial sector is going to desperately need the 1031s. And we also need to protect our opportunity zones that are in process. And a lot of those were working through capital issues. So we're working on an extension for them. And so that's what's happening right now is we are focused on OZs and 1031s, FHAs for appraisals, forbearance for investors. And I will tell you that with your clients, if they qualify for mortgage forbearance, I would be offering that information to them sooner rather than later because a couple of my clients who are in the service sector have already looked into applying for that forbearance. And it's a massive amount of paperwork, as you can imagine, and their lenders suggested to them that they get busy on it now before they get buried because they're going to get buried as people get more panicked. So your proactive people are checking on it now. Now, the client that I had that looked at it today, what they're being offered is three months of forbearance, but it's going to be lump sum at the end of those three months. And so we are looking at this from a legislative perspective of how we can get these mortgage holders to move the three months to the end of the note instead of creating some kind of a balloon that ain't nobody going to be able to pay. Now, what else I can tell y'all is this, and it's probably going to make some of y'all throw up in your mouth a little bit because if you don't have an HR person or a payroll person looking after you, you might not know. If you have employees, you are a small business owner and under the the uh, Paid Leave Act, if you have fewer than 500 employees, you must offer extended family and medical leave and paid sick leave. What that means is that you have full-time employees, they get up to 80 hours of sick leave, part-time workers are eligible based on their scheduled hours in a two-week period. So you need to be making sure that you're in compliance with this federal law and if you're not offering that to your employees, I would suggest that you find a way to make that happen. And the exemption on the paid leave is that if that paid leave jeopardizes the viability of your business, so if you pay in your part-time or two weeks of paid leave, puts you out of business, you can get an exemption. However, the Department of Labor has yet to give us details on how to obtain this exemption. They just said they would get around to it. So, just be checking your payroll and employment policies. If you don't have an attorney who looks at that or somebody in HR, I'd highly recommend that you don't waste any time on that because that's going to take some of our business owners out. I'll also point out to you that, um, what else is on my list? Oh, the Small Business Administration 
and I'm working on my paperwork on this right now is doing a lot of loans for helping keep companies in business. And we don't know, obviously, how long this is going to last. All we know is that if it lasts very much longer, the impact is going to be a boulder rolling downhill. So take advantage of these SBA loans. They are very low interest. And the PDF that I'm going to post in Rev will have a link where you can get information to apply for these low interest loans from the Small Business Administration. And just pay attention that the proposal on these loans does mean that they're forgivable if you keep your employees on payroll. So if you're planning to take out a loan but let people go, you may wind up in a bigger mess than you started. So just really pay attention to this. I know that I make, I'm meeting with my team regularly by Zoom because obviously everybody is working from home. We have decided as a team to shelter in place sooner rather than later and just be smart about things. And in our Zoom meetings, I'm trying to help them all understand that for me to not cut hours aggressively, we have to have all hands on deck with reaching out to our database. And it's become more, uh, I don't want to say frightening because I don't like to be frightened, but it's very grave right now considering the situation in New York. And I'll just point this out to y'all. I spent an hour on the phone with the government affairs director in the state of New York trying to help with the dialogue to get some tiny carve out for real estate because that's that's what I do. Okay, so you may be called on to help outside of your state and outside of your local. And I'm just going to ask you all anything you're asked to do or you can volunteer to do now is when. The people on this call, y'all are leaders in this profession and you have been for years. And I look at these names and y'all are who I have looked up to since I got in 20 years ago. Now's our chance to show the younger agents among us and the newer agents among us what leaders do in this environment. And it's that you don't just take care of yourself. You take care of the profession and you take care of others. And that goes to, and of course, Debbie's obviously one of my heroes because I keep saying her name. I love that woman. But y'all know that when she was talking earlier about being a leader and everything that you're saying and doing, it also goes to Facebook and social media and the comments that are made. And so if you're a leader and you see false information out there, do what I do and pick up the phone and call that person and suggest that they find better resources than what they're doing. And it's a big waste of time, I think, with these people who bitch about NAR and who want the association to put the clamp down on open houses nationwide because y'all, you have to understand that a trade association can't do that. We can't restrict trade because the minute we try to restrict trade, we are going to wind up dead in the water with the DOJ. And so we're looking at this from different angles and perspectives than people on the ground do. So just be the calm, cool, and collected leader who's got facts, information, and data, and who's willing to listen. Because one of the things that's really critical right now is that Those of us in this space, we're probably okay financially for a little bit of time. The bulk of our members in realtor world are not. They were counting on a closing next week to pay their mortgage, to pay their rent, to eat. And when those closings are shut down, shuttered, or stopped, they don't get to eat. And I think that we forget that, those of us that have been in and have been successful for a long time. So many people live on the margin and it's your waiters and waitresses, it's your bartenders, it's your service workers, your hourly workers, the new workers, a newly employed teacher who just finished their graduate degree. You've got all these people on the margins and as leaders in real estate, we cannot forget that. So do not shame people for trying to figure out how to do Zoom listings and Zoom buyers and to create safe methods for themselves, encourage them and thank them for being wise in their practices because we just have to remember not everybody has it as good as we have it. And so anyway, back to my conversation with New York, if you guys aren't reading this stuff carefully, and I'll also tell you this, a good leader doesn't look at headlines and then spout off. A good leader reads what they're given. Um, In New York, the bigger problem with that is that real estate not being an essential service is one thing altogether, but the New York State of Emergency bans phone calls. And those of y'all that are from New York on this call, I had a long legislative conversation about this. It's not just cold calling you can't do. You can't make unsolicited phone calls. 
That means you're not supposed to call your past clients. And we're going round and round with Governor Cuomo's office on this because that to me is restraint of trade. And for most realtors, they're not calling to say, hey, who do you know that needs to buy or sell? They're calling to say, are you okay? Do you need me to drop some bread at your doorstep? Because that's who realtors are. And that's how we've built successful businesses is by deeply caring for people. So we're working on that. And you should know that it does include text messaging. So you're not supposed to send unsolicited text messages. So we've got some real challenges there with implementation of the ideas that you've received here and that you're receiving online. My suggestion, if you are in New York, until we can get better guidance and other states, this is why I am as loudly as I can encouraging realtors to ask for real estate as an essential service. Y'all, we are embedded in our communities in a way that nobody else is. And by the way, New Yorkers, y'all should be sending personal notes. That's about what you can do and sending emails, which nobody's going to read, but do your best. So with the rest of us, you need to contact your local elected officials. If your county and your city are still open for business, you need to send very kind and pointed emails asking them to allow the clerks to register and record deeds that you pledge to abide by all safe practices of distance and sanitation and staying out of the close proximity to other people. What we're looking for when we talk about real estate as an essential service, y'all, as the association and as volunteers, we're not fighting over people being able to go show and write new contracts. We're not fighting over new listings. Our biggest issue right now is the people who I, I'm in Charlotte. OK, and it's Monday. There's a closing that was supposed to happen Wednesday, which is not happening now because the buyer owns a nail salon. We're under forced closure of nail salons as of Wednesday. The lender pulled the loan because that person will have no income. And that's what we're talking about with real estate as essential services. That person is a clear indicator that you've got to, you've got to start figuring out how we, we keep some kind of balance here in the way that we manage a pandemic. But that person is completely scared out of their mind because they don't have anywhere to go. And so as real estate essential services, we're looking here into mainly how do we protect transactions in process so that people don't become homeless and that we can, we can help facilitate what we've been asked to do. And I, I'll emphasize this again, when we ask for real estate as essential services, we are not wanting realtors to have public opens. I do think public opens should stop for the foreseeable future. We're not talking about showing to a stranger. I love Nellis's comment about only having people on title in there and restricting that as much as possible. But just you've got to write these letters, y'all. Tell your county commission, tell your city leaders, please keep it open because we don't want to stop these ones that are in process. And we pledge as realtors to behave as much as we can. Also understand, too, as we're talking about all these things, this is realtor work. And there are a lot of real estate licensees rolling around the country under nobody's guise and nobody's able to rein them in at all. And so we have to be super duper leaders right now to say there absolutely is a difference in realtors and licensees because we are at the forefront of protecting our communities. And when I talk about our communities, I got to give you all I know I've gone over my time here, but hopefully you're you're, you're grasping where I'm going here. In your states, by the way, ask your states for essential uh, for real estate as a carve out. Title is very important and recordation is very important. Just help them understand that this is people's lives on moving trucks. And frankly, if you take somebody who's supposed to move on Wednesday off their truck and stick them in a hotel, they're in far worse risk there than if they were allowed to get into the vacant house where the sellers have already moved. Um, but I totally lost my train of thought there because I That's get okay. I'm very no, heated up good. about this. Lee, this was real. This was incredibly great information. That's why I let you go over on time. Um, uh, what I would love for you to do is we're going to go now to we're going to poll each each panel member. By the way, if you added a Q and A question, there's some really good ones from statements from Ann and Brad Corn and. Um, my suggestion is, is to instead, we're not going to have time to answer them today, is to go on the Rev Facebook group, post what you just posted here, because I thought that was some really good statements, Ann and Brad. Um, let's, 
Lee, we're going to pull the panel now. So um, just give a quick, one quick tip. It could be working from a home tip, something for self-improvement for your personal life or one fun creative service action that you might do. Um, I'll start, I'll go to do it first. So like a really fun thing to do would be a Zoom call with my friends and do a soul train dance contest one night when I can't see them all. And we can all just dance to uh, some fun R&B from the 70s. That's my idea. Lee, what's yours? Please don't invite me to that. Um, so the, <laughs> the, thing, the thing that I'm doing, which is I'm struggling right now, and I will tell y'all, I'm out of Zoloft, and I am known as a very positive person, and this is weighing on me because I feel the weight of 1.4 million realtors on my shoulders, which is what you do when you start focusing on the volunteer life. To fight that in myself, I am posting a daily kids joke. It's the jokes that I've put in my kids' lunch boxes, and I'm trying to be a positive person. And I'll tell you, I'm getting some really good feedback on that, thanking me for being a one uplifting moment in a day that's full of nasty and negative stuff. And I've had a few people reach out and tell me to stop being positive because they're they're worried right now. So I'm ignoring the haters and I'm focusing on the positive because I do that to lift me up as much as my my clients and my sphere. So my suggestion is to be out of your comfort zone in something on video that people can see and laugh with and keep their lives moving. Because as has been said by everybody, the other side is coming. Absolutely. Thank you, Lee. Uh, Paul Grofer, one tip. Patrick, I'll give you two. Um, we've been doing a lot of Zoom calls with the company. And so it inspired me to do set up a Zoom call with my family who i um, literally all over the world. And um, it just felt like like an aha moment in terms of being uh, connected or reconnected. The other thing is my mom's living in a uh, retirement home and it's been on lockdown for a while. Fortunately, she's on the first floor so I can go to the window. And what I've, what I've learned is there are many people there who are sitting in windows who don't have anybody. So anybody that can do even something like that and go there, it's amazing the smiles that you get from these people. Now, literally, it's, it's like they're in jail there. So it's... Um, to go there and see them smile is really, um, it makes you feel good. Awesome. Debbie Yost. I'm here. Okay. If you're working from home, as most of us probably are, get up and get dressed in the morning, take a shower and get dressed. Do not just sit there in your PJs because you can get lost in just focusing on your computer. Get up and get outside your house once a day. You can walk around your block, just get outside and do something different. Don't become a hermit at home in front of your computer. Awesome. James Nellis. Yeah, I like that you said that right after Debbie because I definitely have my Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle pajamas on right now and it's fantastic. Um, I would say, that, you know, two things. One, actually one of my clients posted it. Make sure you drink a lot of water um, with everything that's going on, a lot of people are like, why am I getting a headache? We well, are probably not drinking enough water and with the depression and everything we already mentioned. So drink a ton of water. The good news is you're always near a bathroom. So there's no excuse. <laughs> and then secondly, uh, we talked about being present and I feel, you know, I'm a person of faith and I feel like God calls people to my mind from time to time. Take, since you're not stacked appointment to appointment to appointment, whoever God puts on your mind or in your heart, make sure you call them, make sure you reach out to them. Well said. Brian Bamba. Um, in order to make yourself feel as close to being 10 feet tall and bulletproof as possible, you have to do two workouts a day. Um, I've been jumping on my Peloton at home. Peloton is offering free 90-day classes online for anyone who wants them. There are, there are yoga classes that are, you know, body weight exercises you can do at home. So I do one of those in the morning. And then midday, about 1 o'clock, I'll take a walk with my wife. And those two things have helped clear my head and helped me feel as energized as I can possibly feel under these conditions. Awesome. Jennifer Ames. So uh, Facebook, a quote that said, uh, if you've ever wondered what stay-at-home moms do, you know, now you get it. <laughs> All That's of us funny. are suddenly discovering what is with kids, and it's an interesting challenge. So I think there's a few things that I focus on 
Um, one well, is working with calling your heavenly home and, and talk about, you know, first of all, check in with them, but, but share with them ideas, scavenger hunt ideas, things to do at home, you know, suggestions. One of the things we did as a family, which is really cool, is that we created a family Facebook page out of Mississippi as three little boys under five. And all the other family members have been going on a private Facebook page and reading stories, making videos, and leading yoga and stuff. But think about different ways to, to reach out, maybe a little bit trapped at home with some relief or entertainment. Excellent. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, Lindsay Smith. Two Lindsay. points. Yeah, two points, I guess, Patrick. The first would be this is the fourth crisis I've gone through in my real estate career. And the first one took a long time to get back to, to normal, normal. Every time afterwards, it happened in a more quick manner. So I would suspect this one is going to, it's, it's still going to be a while, but it's going to be happen as fast as anything I've seen in the last four. And I just want to leave everybody with a thought. Lives first, livelihood second. So when you're making your calls, lives first, livelihood second. Well said. John Smith. One of the things we did, Patrick, here in the last week was uh, with the Rotary Club, our goal was to raise $10,000 for our local restaurants. Most, well, all of the restaurants are closed. However, most of them have takeout service. So what we've done, we've identified one restaurant per day and to support that restaurant, either buy food there or buy a gift certificate, we're halfway through, and we've get we've gotten about five thousand eight hundred dollars so far after five days. So that's really a neat thing that we're doing. And one other thing I thought of too was writing a personal note. Going back to the Michael Mayer days, uh, a personal note is so touching and so good. And my thought would be to try to write a personal note, at least ten of them to Sphere of Influence and, and other clients. Awesome, John. John Thomas. So um, just quickly, two things, you know, Patrick, I know you said one, but um, um, a little bit more on what Lindsay talked about is vulnerability. And I'm not saying, hey, the world's coming to an end kind of vulnerability, but just say, hey, you know what, I too am having, you know, a hard time with this, but this is what I'm doing to try and keep myself positive and keep those around me positive. And I've, I've done that. Um, and people have really, they, like clients of mine have sent me messages literally saying, I had no idea you went through that. That makes me, you know, respect your attitude and who you are even more. And so you just never know that you, sh you know, showing a little bit of chink in your armor, which is super hard for me, by the way. Um, you know, that it does work. And my hope for humanity in general is that like some of the other people have said here, Jenny specifically, um, is that we put down our devices and, you know, this is me coming from Silicon Valley. I love my devices, but, you know, connect with the people that we love and, um, you know, face to face in our own homes, you know, connect with children. I, I want to see parents have um, conversations that mean something with their kids again. Um, so many times I go, Jonathan and I go out to eat and you have four people all with four devices in their faces over a dinner table out. And so I'm really hoping that the divide that we see, you know, not only in some homes, but also the country will, will lessen. Awesome. And I think the last one is Seth Daly. So I would leave everybody with the thought that our resourcefulness will always matter more than our resources. And we are in a season right now where what's, what we're losing are resources, even, even access, uh, the stock market, the real estate market, those are all resources. Resourcefulness matters more. And so to that end, when, when Tony Robbins talks about being in a resourceful state, he's talking about three things. One, your physiology, what James said, what Debbie said about water and, and breathing and getting outside. Two, uh, what you focus on. We all we all have the ability to focus our thoughts in one direction or another. And three, the beliefs that we hold and, and the language that we use 
Like those are the three things that create a resourceful state and matter more than anything else. Awesome. So a couple of things. We're going to skip Q and A because we we've already we're over an hour and a half already. Go to the Facebook group, do the Q and A from there. Um, I just am so grateful that um, we were able to bring 10 of my dear friends online who I care about deeply and they care about others. And you can just see that who you surround yourself with is going to affect your experience of the world. So surround yourself with like-minded people who are looking to shine their light in the world and you'll find that you're going to make the world a better place to live but you'll also make your life a lot better thank you guys so much love you all and uh that's the end of this recording